And there's a few of them listed up here. I, I've got all this basically also on uh, that I can email to people. I'll give you my email later on. There's Skype and there's other chat programs. Um, this is kind of neat if you are able to have friends overseas. Skype is a great tool because you can talk directly to them. Now, we've also had some issues though where we've done some Skype conversations for Russia and you knew somebody else was listening in on the conversation. You could just tell. Remote access. How many people only know how to get to their email from their home computer? They don't know how to do it from a library or whatever. Most email, you can get to it from someone else's computer if you need to. It's just a good little skill to know how to have. I've got a, some stuff on the, on the handout about email alerts, and we'll talk to that. And last but not least, we love acronyms. People in this area, they just we've got all kinds of acronyms. Um, this is the end of the world as we know it. Which means all communication systems are down. And this is where it's very important that you plan and that your family knows what your plan is. If I'm working in Dallas, my wife is working in Fort Worth, our kids are at a school, and all of a sudden the pipeline under our neighborhood just blew our house to smithereens and we can't get here. Do we know where we're all supposed to meet? Well, let's say we're going to meet at such and such church or such and such school, which is a few miles west of our neighborhood. And if that doesn't work, then we're going to go to, you know, and so-and-so's house in Argyle or Copper Canyon or Flyer Mountain. Have a plan and make sure that everyone in your family knows what the plan is. Okay, I'm going to talk about social media. How many people Facebook? Good. How many people Twitter? Cool. Okay. I Facebook. I've got a bunch of friends all over the world from, from different things, and it's kind of cool because I can see different aspects of a whole bunch of people's lives. It's kind of you know a fun thing, but it's also a tool. CoServe is my power company, and anytime there's an outage, they post where the outage is on Facebook. Well, for me, that's kind of nice because I work 65 miles from my house, and I'll get a power outage that says, hey, you know, or I'll get a message like that that says, hey, the power is out in the ponder area. Well, I know that my dogs are probably roasting in my house, so I should probably try to call to work early and go on home. And then there's Twitter. I use Twitter exclusively for news information. Um, and I'm on Twitter. If you want to mess with it or if you're on it, you can look me up. You'll see that I've got all the local news channels in Dallas, Fort Worth, Sherman, uh, up towards Oklahoma, the areas that I work. Chances are your police departments are on Twitter or Facebook, your fire departments, your emergency managers. Um, there's some good information that's put out there. That's the Weather Service. That's a Facebook deal. Uh, the Weather Service is cutting edge on Facebook. Y'all remember when they had that supposed threat of the TWU where the guy was supposed to want to get a gun? a little while ago, I mean, it was a few months ago, and they had the campus on lockdown. They did a study after that and found out almost everybody that was involved in that lockdown was getting all of their information off of Twitter or Facebook. I went to a class at the Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman back in March where there were some, I mean, there's a room full of brainiacs. I was by far the stupidest person in the room. I mean, there were guys that had multiple PhDs. One of them said, Social media is, a, is not a fad. Now, Facebook may be a fad, Twitter may be a fad, but the form of communication through social media is a fundamental shift in how we communicate. Now, I'm assuming that all of you still have 8-track players in your cars, and you all go down to the telegraph station, Western Union, to send a telegraph to your man out in Colleen. That's what Facebook and Twitter are. It's like introducing the TV in the radio area. There's a lot of people that are going, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It is that big of a deal. People my age and younger, this is becoming our primary source of information. It's a little scary. There's a lot of bad stuff out there, but it's also a, a wonderful tool. How many of you have smartphones? Androids, magic iPhones. I got a magic iPhone. These screenshots are all from my iPhone. There's a lot of applications out there that can help you with disaster preparedness. This one on the left is called Bolt Meter. It tells you if there's any lightning within 30 miles of where you are. Um, if you do the Little League or Pee Wee or you know, then little softball teams or whatever, this might be kind of handy to have around. Um, you've most of y'all probably seen the map application if you have a smartphone. I discovered that you can see exactly where you are in a satellite photo, and if I hit that arrow button, I can text message my grid coordinates to somebody else. That was kind of a neat little deal. We were out on a search and rescue thing one time. I was trying to explain to my wife where we were, and 
I said, well, here, this is the grid coordinates. You can hit these grid coordinates and your phone will automatically show you exactly where I am. Radar scope is another one. Um, it's also got GPS on it. Um, I'm going to regress a little bit. As you can see, I'm kind of a technology guy, but I also know how to use a topographic map and compass. I was saying, those who trust technology don't understand technology because it, it's going to fail. But when it works, it's a great tool to use. Uh, radar scope has got a GPS thing to show me exactly where I am in relation to the storm. And I've used this a lot, commuting back and forth to either stay just ahead of the storm or right behind the storm so I don't run into the hail. And uh, 5 Radio uses a website called radioreference.com. If you click on one of these, you can listen to these frequencies on your phone. So, you know, if you're sitting at your house and all of a sudden 743 police cars drive by running code, and they're listed on one of these, you can pull them up and see what's going on, you know, do I need to evacuate? Do I need to get the shotgun? You know. I'm going to talk briefly about ham radio operators. This one kind of cracks me up because uh, the ARL, which is like the ham radio's uh, NRA, they had a, uh, or AARP or whoever, they had a uh, uh, article in their newsletter about how many hams have joined ham radio in the last two years. And right above it was an article about Barack Obama appointing somebody to some position. And I said, you know what, most people will never make the connection. That's why I got into ham radio, because I saw, it's more than just Obama, it's the direction the country has been headed for quite a while. I saw where we were going, and I know that communication is a vital aspect. I wanted to be able to get a little radio, a piece of wire, go out at night and be able to listen to foreign, foreigners or whatever, get my information from outside the country, or talk to people without having to be reliant on anybody else. Now, how long have you been a ham, sir? 21 years. Okay, I've only been a ham for less than three, and I know Mark's been a ham for quite a while. You guys know far more than... Matter of fact, I'll tell you what, I did my first HF this last week on 40 meters. First time I've ever done anything on HF. It was really cool. I was talking to people from all over Oklahoma with this tiny little radio. Um, and it's not that difficult to become a ham radio operator. My wife went to the class with us. She'd never done anything with radios, had no problem passing the test. They dropped the Morse code requirement, which is part of the reason why there's been a resurgence in ham radio. Um, I highly recommend looking into it. Uh, it's, it's just that there's a lot of neat things that you can do. It's a good communication source. You learn a lot about how things work. It's not overly technical unless you want it to be overly technical. But like I said, now you know there's internet link repeaters set up, and I can sit in my truck while I'm driving to Oklahoma and talk to guys in California. Which is kind of neat. Yes. Um, it depends on what you're wanting to do. We're fortunate in the Dallas Fort Worth areas because there's a higher concentration of hams than anywhere other than outside of California, I believe. This little radio is like $125. Um, there's so many repeaters around here that you can talk to a lot of people on this little radio. Now, you can spend $10,000 on the radio. Really, he would be, I'm sure you've got a lot of HF experience. Maybe you don't want HF. It's four hours. It's a radio that is registered. AMFM and PRMS, Paranormal Service Radio. Yeah. It's a two way radio. I'm actually just listening to the community. Ham radio is broken up into two areas short range, basically, and long range. I'm kind of oversimplifying. When we talk about HF, it's called the high frequencies, and that's that's across the country, across the world, you know, talking to South America, or Russia, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of different aspects to it. it. It's like a lot of other hobbies. You can do stuff in it fairly inexpensive, but you can also do stuff in it and spend a lot of money. I mean, I've seen guys drop a half million dollars on some radio show up to just out here. But they can talk to anybody, anywhere, anytime, just about what they want to. I mean, they've got some neat stuff. There's all kinds of, uh, it's just amazing. The more I get into it, the more I'm just amazed by all the aspects of the hobby. Um, things that the ham radio operators have developed. You start looking at a lot of the history about what you know, ham radio operators have done in the last hundred years and things. It, it's, it's a neat hobby. Um, you know, you can, you know, if, and I'm sure there's a lot of repeaters around this area. I know that there's, uh, like I said, I know DFW's got the highest concentration of hams outside of, I think, California. And 
you can talk like from here, it'd be easy if it's a good enough repeater, I can talk to people in Louisville, you know, Ferguson, whatever. Go ahead, sir. Everybody got a fire extinguisher in their house? First aid kit? Smoke? Carbon monoxide detector? You know how to shut off the water or gas or electricity in your house if you have to? If you don't, I recommend you might learn that kind of stuff. Especially like me when I woke up it was like the second or third day of Super Bowl week and I was like, hey, I've never heard water run under my house before. I should probably do something about that. Everyday carry. This, this is a part of the aspect of the lifestyle change I was talking about. What do you carry when you walk out of the house? This is some of the stuff that I try to have on me every day when I walk out. Collection of cash and quarters, just in case. Um, thin piece of paper, Leatherman. Spare key for my truck. This is one of those, good judgment comes from experience, experience comes from bad judgment. About the third time I locked myself out of the truck. Which is a hassle now, because with these little smart keys, it's like $127 and three hours to reprogram the key for the truck, but it's a lot better than me being out in the middle of nowhere and be, hey, my truck keys are sitting right there on the dashboard. And a little flashlight. I don't ever leave anywhere without this little flashlight. It's not much. Um, it's only a little one AA battery flashlight. It's small. I carry it in my pocket all the time. What impressed me about this, this is, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, lights like this have made the transition from incandescent to what's called LEDs. It's a light emitting diode that's still just bulb. Um, when I bought this flashlight, I put a lithium AA battery in it. I turned it on, set it in a cup holder in my truck. Seven days later, there was still light coming out of this. It was light enough I could still read with. It wasn't as bright as it is now. But that's what an LED is. An LED is an ultra-efficient light source. Um, the, bat, the bulb light is like 100,000 hours or something. I don't go anywhere without this little flashlight. And it's come in handy quite a bit. Um, on the Leatherman, this is a, another thing I just won't leave home without. This is one of those deals you get what you pay for. You go to Walmart, you buy a $10 Winchester brand made in China. You're buying a $10 Winchester brand made in China. It, it's going to fail on you. Leatherman, Gerber, SOG, the Swiss Army Knife people, they all make great multi-tools. Uh, I'd recommend sticking with one of those four brands. And we're going to talk briefly about food. Everybody's got a room that looks like this in their house, right? <laughs> Actually, probably some of y'all do. Don't tell me. <laughs> anyway, it'd be nice. It'd be nice. If, I mean, that's actually, looks like it's probably about half the size of my house. But, you know, hey, that'd be sweet. That'd be a nice setup. How about this? We could do this, can't we? Yeah, that's that. what mine looks like. There you go. <laughs> Start small. It's not a, you know, you don't have to go out and buy six months worth of food tomorrow if you're going to do go down this road. Matter of fact, I recommend you don't go down and buy six months worth of food tomorrow because everything you buy is going to have the exact same expiration date. So in a year, you're going to have a bunch of food that's no good. Every time you go to the store, just buy a little extra. Every time you use something in your house, think, do I have an extra one of these? Don't forget about the toilet paper. Shaving cream, soap. Contact solution, whatever. Have you got a little bit extra of each one of those? TP does not have an expiration date. TP does not have an expiration date. Thank you. 
Be mindful of the expiration dates and rotating your supplies. There's a company on the handout I gave you, somewhere on the links, called Shelf Reliance. They make these really nice, heavy-duty, restaurant-grade deals. You put a can into it, and it basically rolls to the back of the stack. And so whenever you pick a can up, you're getting the oldest can. Or, yeah, you're getting the oldest can, so you use it. But you can make one, just like this guy did, some 2 by 4s and some plywood. He puts the new stuff in the back, and it just rolls to the front, and that way he's always rotating. Now, I had talked earlier about like the mountain house and the MREs. I don't have anything against any of that stuff, but my preference is I store what I use. So if you're going to use mountain house dehydrated food, or you're going to use MREs, I suggest you use it. If you're going to store it, I suggest that you use it for a while. You may find out that your body doesn't like it after three or four days. And if you're in a disaster situation, that's a bad time to also be having other issues. <laughs> this is another thing people don't realize. MREs have a shelf life basically based on the heat that they're stored in. If you store MREs, like right now, when we're looking at 110, 100 degrees in a storage building, you're looking at less than two years shelf life. Plus, the economics of them really don't make any sense. They're neat. I mean, they're fun for camping. You know, they're kind of handy. I'm not a big MRE person. Maybe it's because I was forced to. Them. Water. This is probably the most important aspect, and it's often overlooked. One gallon per person per day, except right now it's probably about three times that. That may sound like a lot, but you got to think about hygiene also. You know, brushing your teeth, taking a little bucket bath, and whatever you need to do, um, cooking, that kind of things. I really don't think that's enough. So what do you do? Do you do cases of bottled water? Everybody got cases of bottled water stored? They got five gallon jugs like this guy has. Those, those got to be uh, used. Yes. Um, I have open bottles of water that were several years old. They didn't kill me, but they didn't taste that great. Use glass if you can. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of bottled water. Um, and we'll get into it. I've got a water well, so I'm kind of fortunate. Well, our new place has a water well. What about rainwater collection? Have you guys ever seen these? Yep. Now, unless you treat it, you can't drink this, but for bathing, flushing the commode, washing, you know, clothes. washing clothes, this is a good option. Tractor Supply, Home Depot, <coughs> they all sell these. There's several places online that sell these little kits. Believe it or not, there's several states this is actually illegal because rainwater is considered property of the government. <laughs> Where is that? Colorado is one, Utah's one. Um, one of the other western states, like Nevada, I think, maybe. I'd have to look and see. Those laws aren't that new. They're actually old laws that are left over because what they were concerned with is they get so little rain as it is that it was affecting you know, the vegetation and things like that. And from my understanding, they don't really enforce those laws, and they're starting to be overturned. But I'm going to go on I'll chase another rabbit here. I believe for us in this area, our two biggest concerns in the next 10 years are going to be electricity and water because we do not have enough of either one of those for the growth that we're expecting. I don't know if y'all know, but Texas is suing Oklahoma right now to get access to water because they don't have enough and they can't build the reservoirs fast enough. Um, water is going to be a pretty vital thing. Yeah. We had somebody ask earlier that emailed in about, you know, what do we do about the heat? And they said, I don't think people actually live in this area, you know, before air conditioning. Yeah, people did, but they lived a whole lot differently than we did. And if you go into a lot of the older places, you'll see that, like, for instance, downtown Crum is a great example, because Crum is an old 125-year-old town. Um, it's out west, of, northwest of Denton. Um, the houses are small, they're low to the ground, they've got lots of windows that they can open up, they've got big overhangs, they've got, you know, a lot of them have wraparound porches, and they've got huge trees all over them. Well, what do we do? We bulldoze the trees and build brick, big brick houses. Not really conducive to the Texas environment without air conditioning. Um, anyway, and then there's a water well. Has anybody here got a water well? Good deal. Yeah. Have y'all seen these? Is that a grunt it's, it's a That's a uh, bucket. It's a well bucket. Oh, well. It's got a little ball down at the bottom of it. It, float. it doesn't float, but it's got a little ball that sits in this thing right here. And you lower it down in your well because. Water wells aren't like they used to be. They're about this big around. They're usually five inch, six inch casing. Um, you lower this thing down into the well. It holds about a gallon, 1.9 gallons, I think, and then you can pull it out if you lose power. 
Now for me, my well is 200 feet deep, so that's you know 20 pounds. I'm going at 200 feet, so I'm going to be training one of the dogs or something. Put a windmill on. Yeah, you can do a windmill. That would be nice. There's also solar water pumps out there. You buy a pool. Pool's a good source of water. Wouldn't drink it, but you can't use it for a lot of other things. Then we come into treatment of water. When I first got into this, there was a recipe online about adding so many drops of chlorine bleach to so many gallons of water, and it would basically disinfect it. It's like, great. It's a great solution. Went down to Sam's, bought like, I don't know, 15, 20 gallons of chlorine bleach. Found out a couple of years later, chlorine bleach has a shelf life. <laughs> the Clorox company knows people use Clorox for treating water, and they say on their website, after six months, it wouldn't, it's not reliable for treating water. Um, this is my preferred method. It's called the Big Burton. You pour water in the top. It's got four big filters. I haven't done this, but I, there's a guy that actually wrote a book about it. He lived off of one of these with like water out of a swamp for like a year. He's still alive. So, I mean, go ahead, sir. I lived in West Africa and we had to put all our water. We boiled it first and it all went in there. Yeah. Filtered. Yeah, it's a great it's system. Stone filter. Yeah, it's got huge. I mean, there's little ceramic filters or some kind of, yeah. There's four of them sitting there in the filters. Go ahead, man. Do you? I know a lot of people that treat city water. They'll pour their city water in there. And then, yeah, they love it. They're expensive. I mean, they're several hundred dollars a piece. But, I mean, it's the Cadillac of water treatment, in my, in my opinion. I think there's home, off, uh, home uh, osmosis units now, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen the little pins that you can stick in the water and have the UV lights on them. Um... So, you go down the preparedness route, and then, like me, you start thinking, well, it's more than just stockpiling stuff. I really need to become more self-reliant. I really need to learn the things that my grandfather knew that I didn't get to learn because I lived in the suburbs. Um, and then you go, well, maybe I should start thinking about self-sufficiency. This is a, a homestead on one-tenth of an acre. I don't know if you can make it out, but they got everything on there. They got a little chicken coop, all kinds of gardens. Um, Let's see, what else is on the thing? Rabbits, beehives, herb garden. It's, you can't be completely self-sufficient in today's society without not having a life. I mean, you can move to the mountains and live like a mountain man, but you have to keep in mind, the mountain man's average lifespan was like 37 years old. That's where most of them died. Um, but you can get yourself more self-sufficient, and that's really my goal, as I got into the preparedness thing, um, well, then I was like, well, you know, it's more than just having stuff. I, I realized I'm reliant on some guy in China to make my jeans, and I'm reliant on, you know, somebody in India to process my coffee beans or whatever. And, you know, the last truck I had it was a Dodge truck. It was made in Mexico. And, and I realized globalization is here whether we like it or not. You can minimize how much you're relying on other people, but you can't actually knock it out completely. Well, you can, like I said, but you won't have a life. But you can try to work yourself towards being more of a producer and less of a consumer, and that's kind of where we are right now. It's different strokes for different folks, though. Financial preparedness. You have 30 seconds to leave your house before it's wiped out by a herd of radioactive, fire-breathing giant collapses. <laughs> what do you take with you to rebuild your life administratively? Has anybody ever thought about this? I mean, your house is wiped off the face of the earth. Insurance policies, wills, bank statements, credit card statements. Well, most of us wouldn't miss the credit card statements. Marriage certificates, military records. Yeah, you can go places and get all that stuff again, but, you know, if you've got a little bag with clothes and some food in it, why not have another little bag or even maybe a little thumb drive or a CD with your financial stuff and your administrative stuff? You know? um, there were a lot of lessons after Katrina on this. There was a guy who wrote a blog called Listening to Katrina. His family basically just had to evacuate. They had to just grab it and go. And he had to rebuild his entire past and his wife's past and his kids' past by going to the schools and getting the records if they, if they had them still. You know, going to the banks. Social Security office and all that stuff. And he wrote an entire, it's almost a book on what he learned from doing that. And now he has a little briefcase that's got copies, certified copies if he needs them, a lot of stuff he scanned and put onto a little USB drive. 
Um, a lot of people don't think about this aspect. You know, the most important part is saving your life. But if you can do something ahead of time to help, you know, I mean, who really wants to go to the DMV to get another driver's license? Or the Social Security Administration to get another Social Security card? So, evacuation. Here comes the mutant swarm of hummingbirds. You have to evacuate. What do you grab? Where is it? It's at night and powered anymore. Do you still know how to do it? Do you have a flashlight by your bed? Can you, can you get out of your house? Can you get up? Think about what you need. What if you have pets? Please do not leave. I have 18 dogs. My wife and I have 18 dogs. Um, yeah, it's, everybody has mental problems and that's mine. Um, what about your pets? Please don't leave your pets. There were hundreds of horror stories that came out of Katrina of pets basically dying, starving to death in, in their owner's homes. Special needs, you know, you have elderly parents living with you, you have anything like that that you need to think about ahead of time. This is a little exercise called Flip the Breaker Weekend. Um, I got the idea for this from a friend of mine who was in Oklahoma City who was in Florida at a conference and her roommate, or a woman that was living with her, called her, this was uh, three or four years ago and had that bad news from Oklahoma City, and said, hey, we've just lost power, they're saying it's going to be a while, they're telling everybody to go to a hotel. Well, my friend said, I'm coming home and I'm going to stop at a Home Depot, she bought a generator, she bought some supplies, they, and these people, both of them, see, one of them is probably in her early 50s and one's in her mid-60s. They stayed in her house for a week with no power and freezing temperatures. And they took notes. They came out of there with a book. And that next spring, she had this long list of things about what to fix on her house, where the drafts were coming from, what she needed to do about, you know, the fireplace needed extra wood. She started storing a few boxes of those Dura logs, things like that. So I got the idea for her, go out this weekend, Saturday morning, and go shut off the main breaker in your house. Yeah, it's 102 outside. Yeah, your house is going to get really hot really fast. But at least you'll start to get a glimpse. And you may have to go in there and flip the breaker back on, get the air conditioner back on. But it's going to give you an idea. Now, some of you have probably experienced air conditioner outages. You know how fast your house gets hot. But it's a good learning experience. Take notes, evaluate, learn, prepare for it in case it's not an option. The breaker gets flipped, not by your choice. And then later on down the road, try it again when it's 35 degrees out. We're starting to wrap up a little here. I know we've kind of gone a little long. But, um, this is my top ten list. Number one is develop a plan with your family about what to do if you can't communicate. If you lose communication with each other, where do your kids go? Or whoever that you know is in your area of responsibility. Number two, keep your vehicles at least half full fuel at all times. This is a big one with me. I'm, I'm pretty adamant on this one. Um, you never know when you're going to have to jump in your car and just and get out. Um, wildfires, floods, whatever. Keep at least two weeks worth of groceries and drinks in your house. I mean, really, it would be nice if there's a lot more, but I mean, I've seen a lot of people that they don't even have two days worth of groceries in their house. Keep $200 and $20 bills on you. Go get $200 and 20s, stick them in the back of your wallet, put a paper clip, a rubber band, or something on them so you don't use them. I've got friends that carry several $100 bills with them. It's great until they need to buy four gallons of gasoline, and of course the guy doesn't have change. So, and I get that a lot with people that will store gold or silver. Um, my preference is silver because I don't have to spend a $1,500 gold piece on a loaf of bread. Get a NOAA weather radio, which like I said, they're called all hazard radio. It has, needs to have alert capability. Um, there's a website on that handout that I gave you that will explain uh, a little bit about them. Keep an old-fashioned touch tone phone if it's possible, serviced by the wires like we talked about. If not, you, know, you can't do it. Learn how to read a map and find alternative map routes. Now, judging by the age of most of the people in here, I'm sure you guys grew up with maps. Unfortunately, there's a whole group of society my age and younger that they wouldn't know how to use one of these if they had to. Well, I got the little box that talks to me on my dashboard. This map is available at Barnes & Noble and Walmart. Um, it is the best map I've ever seen. Uh, they have them from every state. It's got every dirt road, everything you can imagine on there, and it's got topography, if you know how to read a topographic map on there. Um, yeah, it's big. You buy one and throw it in your trunk. Um, there are some of the bold-up maps uh, that I've discovered don't have roads on them. 
Like there's a bridge that crosses the Red River about 20 miles west of I-35, and I've just about never seen it on any Polet map. It's on this map. It's, it's called the New Bridge, because it was only built 35 years ago. <laughs> but it's the Courtney Bridge, if any of y'all are familiar with Southern Oklahoma. And it's not on most fold up maps, but it is on this. Now, even this does have its issues. I mean, like our street up in our neighborhood, it says it connects to the farm lane, the next one over, which it doesn't get in. But it's better than the fold up maps again. I think there's two brands. Which one is that? That's the DeLorme. Yeah, the DeLorme. And there's like there's another brand. That, um, Rand McNally. Yeah, Rand McNally. Um, it's also a good one. It's a little, Rand McNally I think is a little smaller than that Sometimes one. insurance companies like Farmers or State Farm, mm -hmm. will print those up. We're talking about a national map. Yeah. And they're about half that size. They're hard to read, but they're yeah. something to throw in your car. Yeah. Um, how many of you are first aid and CPR qualified? Good. That, that would be where I would say start. Take a first aid and CPR class. I've got more training than I care to think about in a wide variety of subjects. But I try to get myself into some kind of a class at least once a month just to keep my class taking skills up. Even if it's only a half a day course on, well, for instance, last month I went to a course on board development for nonprofits. Um, you know, something on ham radio or law enforcement or first aid. And on the handout I gave you, there's links to the FEMA website where you can actually take online courses for free on some of their different areas of disaster. Um, if you're prone to wearing high heel sandals, crocs, flip flops, etc., then it's a good idea to keep a pair of broken in hiking boots or at least tennis shoes in your vehicle or your workplace. I don't have anything wrong with sandals or flip flops or whatever, not something you want to hike 10 miles back to your house. At the third date I was on with my wife, there was a train derailment in Roanoke. We happened to be going through. I was like, hey, let's go to the train derailment. She was wearing flip flops. <laughs> so she's never worn, I don't think, flip flops since. <laughs> um, and finally, the last one is learn how to load, operate, and shoot a gun, even if you swear you'll never own one. I don't really think I'm going to have an issue with this group on that. I have a feeling that y'all you know, probably as well on as I am. Could I go back one yeah. step on, on the class? There, may I make a statement? Go ahead. Yes, sir. I'm a CERT. I don't know if anybody here oh, yeah. is a CERT, if you know it's CERT, if you haven't mentioned it. Yeah. That's Community Emergency Response Team. Their class is being held, I think it's Colleyville, and they're, uh, North Richland Hills, Euless, Bedford. And they're held by the fire departments or the police departments. They're official classes. They last about, uh, oh, they're about 10 classes. They're free. And they teach you a lot of this stuff, a little bit more in detail and mm -hmm. depth. And you mm -hmm. actually have uh, practice sessions where you do go out and do stuff. Yeah. And uh, I just want to point out that the CERT, just check with your local fire department, and they'll, they'll direct you to local CERT training. Yeah, that brings up a good point on that handout on one of the pages. There's a listing for the Citizen Corps, which is the uh, or, organization that falls, CERT falls under. There's also the Medical Reserve Corps and several other aspects. Go ahead, sir. I, I was wondering, uh, what are we going to do if they ever do an EMP attack? Going to do smoke stations? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, you know, that's the thing. I, there's a lot of hype with EMPs. It's the boogeyman, basically. <coughs> I hope we never find out. Um, it's pretty much <coughs> a high altitude EMP would affect the whole nation. It's pretty much my worst nightmare um, because I think it has the potential to really, really cause a lot of death and chaos. Um, there's a book out, and I don't know if any of y'all have read it, called One Second After. And it's very well written. I don't agree with everything that happens and how it happens in this book. It's on the last page. I've got three must-read books on the last page of the handout. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give this book to Julie, and then she can read it if she hasn't read it, and she can pass it on to whoever wants to read it. Uh, it's a great book. Um, the thing about it is, when you get into preparedness fiction, it's a fiction novel, most of the guys that write it are like me. They're into preparedness. They have no business whatsoever trying to write a book because they can't tell a story. I mean, you guys have seen me. I'm just kind of wandering all over the place. This guy is actually a very well-written author. Um, the story flows good. That book has probably done more to advance preparedness 
in the country than anything else I'd say since 9-11. Um, he, he really opened a lot of eyes. He was a bestseller for a while. He opened a lot of eyes to realize, because the scenario is plausible. The results, you know, there's some speculation. Some people believe through some um, experimentation it's not going to affect near as many vehicles, for, for instance. Instead of being seven or eight out of ten vehicles, there has been some experiments done that say it may just be a few vehicles, but still there's going to be a few vehicles that aren't going to work again. Um, without a doubt, the electric grid will go down. Nobody denies that. Everybody says, you know, if we have an EMP, it's going to completely wipe out electricity, and it's going to be, depending on where you are, it may be quite a while, a year or two, before you make the electricity back. It could be cosmic too. It doesn't have to be made. Yeah, it does not have to be an EMP. You know, like I said, a, a big solar flare, a big solar storm can cause the same thing. Um, I have a lot of people say, well, okay, should I should I stay in my house if this happens, or if this happens, should I go to my grandma's house out in you know Bowie? You know, that's part of your planning, but you also have to remain kind of dynamic. Because there's a lot of things that could affect us. You know, let's say that jet fuel pipeline happened to blow up right now. Well, if it blow up over there, I can still make it home and ponder. But if it blows up on this side, I can't go home without having to go through Louisville and do all that. You've got to have the ability to improvise and adapt. We had a saying in the Marines, improvise, adapt, and overcome. So there's not necessarily always if A happens, then you do B. If C happens, then you do D. No, if A happens, you do B, C, D, E, F. It depends on what's going to fit your scenario. It depends on who you're responsible for, where your kids are, where your wife is, where you happen to be at the time, what the time of day is. I mean, there's a lot of different variables thrown out there. I hope we never see, I mean, it's, an EMP is highly unlikely, but it is possible. And it's pretty much a worst case scenario for me. So, go ahead, sir. I think we have a bigger uh, possibility of one of these trains derailing around yes. here spilling a bunch of chlorine gas yeah because they do have chlorine on chlorine them gas that's stuff. because they use it in every uh, water mm -hmm. facility and so chlorine is uh, probably one of the higher when you had a list of uh, things one of the yeah. higher problems we'd have oh, toxic i went to a school in pueblo colorado uh, in